Hey guys, and welcome to Fika with Rice, a podcast about life hacks, inspirational life stories, routines, and keys to success. I'm your host, Frederick Van Hoon, and each week I meet some of the most incredible people in the world from self made millionaires, best selling authors, experts, and world class athletes. My goal is to extract their wisdom, mindset, tools so you can use them in your daily life, but above all, to inspire you. Let's get this Fika started. Welcome to episode 14 by Fika with Rice. This week we meet Melanie Desiel. Melanie is a keynote speaker, award-winning branded content creator and a lifelong storyteller. Melanie is also the founder and chief content officer of StoryFuel, which teaches marketers, creators and companies how to tell better stories. She is also the author of the best-selling book, The Content Fuel Framework, How to Generate Unlimited Story Ideas. A very inspirational conversation filled with tactical advices on how you can start telling the world your story already today. This is Melanie's story. Let's go. Hello, Melanie. Welcome to Fika with Rice. I'm so happy to have you on the show. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you for um, for being part of this show. And I'm so excited to talk to you about storytelling and, and content creation because you're such an expert in that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. I could talk about that stuff all day. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, I'll rein it in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sounds great. I I wanted to start this conversation to ask about your parents. Yeah. Uh, what did your mother or your father teach you about storytelling? So you know, I I always look back and I joke about how my my parents used to they they tell me that when I was younger I would make books as like a hobby. I would sort of like sit down and, you know, um, put paper together and like draw out these little stories. And, um, it was something that, that they really encouraged in me. I don't know that they, they necessarily pushed it, uh, or tried to like push me in that direction, but they saw that I had that, that spark of creativity that I liked to, to tell stories and write down stories and retell dramatically, you know, things that happened to me. And, uh, they really, they really encouraged that they were, uh, books were like the most common gift in my house. So there was a lot of encouragement of, of reading great stories, of, you know, embracing your imagination, of trying to, uh, trying to take yourself to those places that you may not get to see in real life by, by embedding yourself in a story. That's amazing. What, what's a, uh, what was your favorite book when you grew up, if you had one? Ooh, oh my gosh, it's really tough to choose. Um, I really liked um, The Tales of Robinson Crusoe. Uh, it was just, it was such a fantasy land and it was, you know, not too far away from reality. You know, it wasn't, I never took to super fantasy, you know, like aliens and werewolves and vampires, like that wasn't necessarily my jam. Um, but I liked the stories that were set in reality and just a little bit of magic sort of sprinkled in there. And so, uh, that to me was, was really cool. We had, uh, the Swiss family Robinson was another one that I really enjoyed. Uh, those those stories. It was like the potential of adventure. I think is what I was drawn to. Cool. That's really cool. Um, you worked for the Huffington Post, the New York Times, but you're now you're an author and you're an award winning branded content creator and a storyteller. <laughs> what did you want to do when you grew up? Oh my gosh, I wanted to do so many different things. Uh, I couldn't decide because I would like we were just saying, I would read a book or I would see a show and I'd be like, oh, I want to do that. I want to do that. So uh, I I changed my mind a lot. But uh, I know that at one point I wanted to work in an ice cream shop because I thought that must be the best job, right? You could just taste ice cream all day. Uh, So that one stuck around for a while. Uh, I had a lot of ambitions of working in in law in some way. So like uh, being a lawyer or, you know, law enforcement or CIA, or, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to do something where I was sort of like investigating and enforcing the laws. Um, and I also had a lot of aspirations of, of jobs with animals. So I really wanted to like, I don't know, work at a chimpanzee preserve was one of the, one of the jobs that I really wanted sort of like BJ and Goodall. Uh, and I also wanted to work at a zoo. You know, I just, I sort of chased whatever uh, topic was interesting to me at the moment. So I kept, I kept my options open. <laughs> uh, you know, when I was, when I grew up, I also wanted to become a lawyer. Um, then, you know, the, my, the passion to defend those that couldn't defend themselves was something that really intrigued me. Yeah. You know, and that, that is actually not too far off from kind of what drove me to get into journalism in the first place. That's, that's what I ended up studying in school. 
Uh, and it was very similar in that your job was to sort of be a voice for the voiceless. You know, you tell the stories of people who have been wrong to try to get them justice. You bring light into wrongdoing so that, you know, people can be held accountable. And I really liked that idea that I could not only learn a lot by covering these different topics and meet really interesting people by, you know, seeing these folks who have been through all kinds of different experiences, uh, but also that you were, you had that same sort of element of trying to serve people. You know, my job is to, is to elevate voices who don't have a platform and to, you know, hold those in power accountable. Uh, so it had very similar uh, vibes to the early journalism, uh, you know, aspirations I had and, and some of the lawyerly aspirations, I suppose. Yeah, that's cool that you see the correlation, you know, <laughs> between law and, and journalism. Yeah. yeah. Um, for those that are listening that might not know what content creation is or content creating, um, how would you define that? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways you could define it. I mean, I think in the broadest sense, anytime that you are creating any piece of media with the purpose of communicating to someone else, that's content creation. So for all of us in our everyday lives, this might be when you're writing that email to your boss or a colleague and you're being very intentional. I want to make sure I word this right so I don't offend them, so I don't you know, come off as pushy, whatever it is that you're, uh, you're thinking of as you're writing that email. That's you being intentional about creating a piece of content. Um, so that kind of thing happens in our everyday world. You know, taking a really beautiful photo of your pet or your child or whoever else, like that's also really intentional content creation. From a, a marketing standpoint, which is where I spend most of my time, uh, this is really how brands are doing the same thing, brands and companies. So thinking about what is it that, you know, apparel brands are sharing on, on Instagram to show off their fashions, right? Uh, they have to be very intentional and strategic about that. You think about uh, B2B, business to business brands, you know, how are they communicating very technical things uh, in a very easy to understand way for their audience? So we're thinking about a lot of those same problems that as individuals, we think about, you know, when we're crafting a text message or, you know, taking a good, a good uh, photo or I don't know, probably doing a TikTok these days more so than an Instagram, but uh, that's, that's all content creation. And so I'm just taking those same practices and trying to put it to work in marketing. That's great. So let's say that I am, okay, I am an entrepreneur, but there are other like young professionals out there. And why do they need content for their business or their own profile, you think? Yeah, well, the, the interesting thing is that for all of you who are, who are entrepreneurs or thinking of going that way, you are already creating content, whether you realize it or not, right? So I assume that your product may have, or your business may have a website, you probably are on social media, even as yourself, just promoting the work that you're doing. All of that is content creation. The emails you write, the social media activity, uh, you know, packaging for a product or the way you describe services on your website, uh, all of that is content. So we need content in order to be able to communicate with our audience. If we just create our product or our service and then sit in an empty room and hope someone just magically finds out about it through telepathy, like that's probably not going to not going to work out well. So if we want to spread our message, if we want to reach new audience, then we need content to do that. And so, uh, like I said, we're all doing it anyway. So it makes sense for us to spend a little extra time to do it with some intention to really think about things like what's the impression that I'm giving when I share this type of thing or what kind of tone of voice, you know, would make the most sense. Should I be authoritative? Should I be funny and relatable? Uh, you know, should I be a coach and a guide who's helping people with something, but not talking down to them? You know, you think through these types of questions uh, to figure out how can I create uh, content that connects with my audience in a way that's going to really serve my goals as an entrepreneur. That's uh, that's um, that's some really interesting thoughts that you're sharing, <laughs> especially let's say that I mean, in my case, I just. I mean, I just started an Instagram account uh, a few weeks ago. I learned how to do a story. My colleague taught me. Um, and I mean, and everyone, I'm sure everyone, a lot of people that are out there on Instagram, they might just have a few hundred people are following you. And it's like basically yeah. your family and friends. Sure. So how would you, what, how would you know what type of content to put out there? Because at the same time, you want to promote your own, profession or your services or whatever you're selling. But at yeah. the same time, your friends might not be the customers to that. <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, I think 
I like to draw a lot of analogies to our everyday life because I think so much of marketing and storytelling, it's very intangible. Like it's all just made up non-physical things happening on the internet, right? Um, But I like to think of it sort of the way we dress and show up in our everyday life. So we understand that if we're at home, we can kind of be casual, you know, we can we can wear whatever we want. But if we're going to to work or to a job interview or an award ceremony, somewhere where we want to impress people and we want to look professional, we know we've got to put a little bit of polish on, right? So you might put on a tie or a suit or a jacket or you know, maybe different shoes that are shinier than normal, right? You make those small tweaks, you're still you and you're still yourself. You're just showing up a little bit differently because you're showing up in a different place, in a different context. And so you can think of your your social channels, your business content, if you will, uh, in the same way. So you might decide that who you are in your casual self is exactly who you are in your business self. So if you're a skater and your business is around skating, well, then you're in luck, right? You can just share the things you do every day and that's aligned with your business. Um, but if in your personal life, that's kind of separate from the brand that you're creating, you don't want your face to be the face of the brand or, or of your company, then you might need to create those two separate accounts or those two separate voices that you can use so that you kind of have your, your sweatpants and, and hoodie self at home, right? For your family and friends on one account. Um, but you have your suit and tie version of yourself for your business account so you can make the impression you want to make. Um, it can be tough to know what exactly you should talk about. Um, I, did, I, I wrote a book about this, not to, be, uh, not to be too self-promotional, but I wrote a book called The Content Field Framework, How to Generate Unlimited Story Ideas. So the book can definitely help with that. Um, but another thing you can just do is talk to your customers. Talk to the people who you're trying to reach. Who do they trust? Who do they listen to? What type of content do they watch? Which social platforms are they on, right? Just by having that conversation, you'll start to understand, well, if this is the stuff that they like and this is where they look for it, then I should create stuff like that and I should put it where they're looking for it, right? Uh, so that, w- that would be my recommendation. Start with really good conversations with your, your target audience. Uh, even if you don't have them yet, you know, make some introductions. Uh, have those conversations and you'll get lots of ideas about what they're looking for and where. Thank you for that, Melanie. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure, I mean, there's a lot of business owners, young professionals, a lot of entrepreneurs like yourself and myself that are creating content. We know, we think we know our audience. We're, we're putting <laughs> out the content out there on social media, on LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, and, and so on. What are the top two or three um, most common mistakes people do when they're putting out content? Yeah. So one that happens, and this is especially true for for entrepreneurs, for solopreneurs, uh, the first one is to try to be everywhere at the same time. Uh, In an ideal world, if we had 20 people on our team, then sure, we could be active on every single social platform. We could be putting out content every day, posting everywhere every day. That would be amazing. But we're not there yet, most of us, right? So it's really important to choose where you're going to put your most effort and really go all in on that. I would much rather see an entrepreneur or you know a budding business spend most of their time creating Instagram content or or LinkedIn content, whatever makes sense for you, wherever your audience hangs out, like we talked about before. I would much rather see you put eighty or ninety percent of your effort into one or two platforms than to spread yourself thin and put five or ten percent effort into a whole bunch of different platforms. Because when you can't dedicate enough time to it, enough resources none of them are going to get the results you want. So my recommendation is always go ahead and secure those handles. I know we want to get like the right usernames and everything's aligned. Put up your logo and direct people in that bio to wherever you're going to spend most of your time. Send people over to Instagram. Send people over to TikTok. Send people to your Facebook page. Whatever it is uh, that you're dedicating that resources to, do that. Because that's... Spreading yourself too thin and not seeing any results is a, is a really common mistake early on. That's so, some good tips. Very <laughs> good tips. Um, so let's say that I am an entrepreneur. I'm thinking about starting to tell my story. I've chosen Instagram and LinkedIn, for example. Mm-hmm. What are some other two, three actionable tips that you can share that anyone can start with today? Like how should one start? 
Yeah. Well, a few things I like to remind people is that your everyday life is a really great source of content. And again, that's going to depend on how much of your personality is your brand. Like, are you the brand in the company or is the company, you know, its own logo and entity? So look for opportunities to create content in your everyday life. So here's a really tactical example of that. If you are answering a lot of emails for customers who are asking questions, those answers are probably really good contenders for a blog post because lots of people have that question. So you already wrote the answer to the email, right? You already gave the explanation of how to fix that problem. Why not just take that and turn it into a blog post or turn it into a quick post on LinkedIn? Um, So mining your everyday life, look for content. It's hidden everywhere in what you're doing already rather than having to create additional work for yourself. And the other thing I always recommend is to create content in batches. So again, coming at you with the analogy, when you do laundry, you save up your laundry for a period of time, right? And then you do the whole load of laundry at once. You don't wake up in the morning and wash the one shirt that you want to wear that day, right? That wouldn't make any sense. It'd be a lot of extra work and you'd be going back and forth to the laundry all the time. So if you think about your content the same way, if you want to be posting on LinkedIn and Instagram every day, why are you going back to that, that laundry every single day, right? Why don't you spend some time on a Monday or a Saturday and build up seven or eight posts, write them in advance, pick the photos. That way you have them ready to go. You could dedicate one chunk of time, stay in that right mindset for content creation, and then just roll them out, right? Use your outfits over the course of a week until it's time to do, uh, to do next week's load. That's a really good tactical advice. I love that, <laughs> Melanie. I love that. Do you, do you think I try you to be to do- as practical as possible, you know, because I think, I think sometimes what happens, honestly, is uh, we look at the people in our industry and in our space who are very, very successful, you know, people like uh, who are influencers and it seems from the outside, like they have it all figured out, like it's easy for them. And what we don't realize is that behind the scenes, those people generally have a lot of support. They probably have someone managing their social media for them. They probably have software and tools that they're using to optimize it, to edit the photos. They probably have an assistant who's making sure that all this stuff goes out on time. If there's someone like Gary Vaynerchuk, they might have a 40-person team managing the content that they create, right? And so I think it's really important, especially for, for entrepreneurs who are starting out, to understand that you don't have to be that. You don't have to do that right away. You are one human. You only have 24 hours in a day. And your business needs a lot of those hours. So let's be, let's be strategic about where we put our time. Let's create our content in batches so that it's ready to roll out and it doesn't distract us from building our business throughout the week. So I think it's, I think it's just important to be, to be realistic. I don't want folks to feel like they're a failure if they can't you know, somehow on the side operate a you know, world-class Fortune 500 marketing uh, you know, enterprise just on the side while also building a business. It's true. I, I love that analogy of doing the, the laundry. It, it's amazing, Melanie. <laughs> I just find, I think analogies are really, really helpful because sometimes when you take uh, a marketing you know, activity or a business activity and you just compare it to everyday life, you're like, oh, of course, that makes so much sense. Why hadn't I thought of it that way? <laughs> it's true. I, um, I train uh, martial arts on, on the side, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And mm-hmm. some things are really complicated. And my, my, my coach, my professor, he always breaks it down in, um, in an analogies. And I love it because it's so easy to remember. Yeah. Well, I think it, that's important for us to remember too when we're thinking about the stories we tell our audience because our business, our products, our services, they're very familiar to us. Like your, like your coach, right? You know all the moves. You know how it all works. Um, but our audience isn't as familiar. Our customers might not know how it works. They might not know that they need to solve this problem. So that kind of thing, breaking it down simply and using analogies with your audience might be a really good tool for helping them to understand something that they may not be as familiar with as you are. Yes. Um, As a preparation for this conversation, I heard that you have said that there are three main obstacles for people when they're putting out content. I think you mentioned maybe one of them now, like maybe insecurity, you're seeing like all these influences, Gary Vaynerchuk and all the other like amazing people. I mean, they're putting out a great, great stuff there. And you might feel 
that you have low self-esteem, you know, that, well, I'm, maybe I'm not that good enough, so I'm not going to even going to start. But you said there are three things and there are time, uh, lack of resources, and then confidence. Well, I mentioned confidence. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the top strategies you would say that people can use to combat this? So the time one we've addressed a little bit, that's where the, the batching of content comes into play. You don't have to necessarily worry every single day, where am I going to find time to post today? Uh, you could do some of that in advance. There's also some, some free and cheap tools out there that can help you save time. So um, as an example, something like Feedly, Feedly or some other RSS feed, there's lots of options out there. It will automatically gather links and posts that are uh, in in the area that you define, so about business or about you know software as a service or about skating, like we said before, right? So it'll give you a whole list to choose from, and that'll save you a lot of time searching around and trying to find articles that you can share or photos you can use. So that's one way to save some time, and then scheduling tools as well. So uh, when you're creating your emails or or writing posts on social media or you know publishing blogs on your website. Uh, all that can be done in advance and scheduled. And that makes it so that you don't have to spend the time and switch gears every day to, okay, I've got to go back to the computer. I've got to open up the document, write the blog post, push it out. Um, so all those things, if you're using scheduling tools, can really help uh, save you time and save you switch costs too. Because sometimes changing from one activity to another and then trying to go back, it could really mess with your, your focus and your, your flow. Uh, so having that stuff ready to go can, can be a big help. Um, the other, so the first one was, uh, was confidence. We talked about, we talked That's about right. time. So what's left? Oh, I think we have lack of resources as well. So the other one is the lack of resources. And I think this is a, a, I mean, this is true of all entrepreneurs, right? We're always bootstrapping. We're always trying to make the best of any funds that we do have. Um, so, you know, you want to be smart about that. One thing that I, I love is, you know, that, that topic we mentioned before of just mining your life for content. So as things are happening to you throughout the day, um, you know, just keep track of those different things. If you have an idea or a question that comes up or you think of a really cool analogy, right? Uh, something in the news reminds you of your business. Just keep track of that somehow. A note on your phone, email yourself, voice memo, whatever works for you. Um, because I think sometimes we think we need to hire out that kind of expertise that, I, okay, I need to hire a, a dedicated TikTok person and I need to hire someone who's going to write all of our emails and I need to hire someone who's going to run our Instagram. Um, but if you start to think of content as something that you find, like those ideas, you can find them around you, it becomes a lot easier and you may no longer feel the need that you need to hire someone else. Um, so that can save on resources. And the other thing I always remind people is there are really talented students out there who might love the opportunity to work with you, to work with your business as part of an internship. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, schools have a lot of flexibility around how internships are structured. And they do allow for small businesses, uh, local businesses especially, to, to serve as you know, hosts for interns. So it's just a matter of reaching out to the right schools or finding the right programs or you know, posting, posting an internship job opening and, and seeing who, uh, who reaches out. So uh, really talented people at that level you don't necessarily have to think that just because someone is uh, is younger or still a student that they can't, uh, you know, add a ton of value and, and just in exchange for credit, you know? It's true. Like, yeah, Melanie, like before this conversation as well, I, I thought of you as, okay, this uh, storytelling queen. And now <laughs> I'm starting to realize the more I talk to you that you're also, you seem to ha have a hack for productivity as well. <laughs> Well, you know, I think uh, that comes with a territory a little bit. So, um, I mean, and entrepreneurs are good at this too, right? We, you're juggling so many different things. You're wearing so many different hats. And so this is something I picked up when I was running my own, my own business when I first started uh, my firm, Story Fuel, uh, back in 2015. You know, all of a sudden, I was exactly what we talked about. I was the expert. I was running our social media. I was doing our bookkeeping and our accounting, right? I was doing everything. So you have to find ways to, to save time and try to make it all happen. Um, and luckily, you know, uh, uh, two years ago, I had my daughter and uh, that has certainly helped me learn how to multitask and save time. Um, you know, I think having a, having a kid or a pet or, you know, some other responsibility like that really helps you examine your calendar in a little bit more detail. And so 
yeah, I've had to had to learn how to how to hack the system a little bit to get everything done for sure. Yeah, I was gonna mention that because I know you have um you have a daughter. Mm-hmm. And um okay, so I'm sure there are a lot of parents out there and they're probably freaking out. They're working a lot and they just got a newborn. Okay, what's the secret sauce, Melody, to balance parenthood, motherhood, doing the groceries, laundry? <laughs> Cleaning the house and running a successful business, being an author, and yeah, <laughs> I uh, I wish I had the answer because I think I would be very very rich and probably in a different line of business. Um, I don't I don't have the answer. I don't know all the answers on that. I can tell you some things that I've tried that have worked for me, but I know everybody's situation, everyone's resources are different. Um, so one thing that has helped me is uh, the same way I approach the content creation, trying to find where can I outsource and and how can I automate things or or batch things. That's exactly what I do with with things in the home that are personal. So um, you know, if I'm my husband and I will use grocery scheduling, we'll get grocery delivered on a schedule, right? We're using Amazon subscriptions to get things just showing up at the door when we need them. I don't have to remember to order more diapers or whatever else. It just comes. Um, so that kind of thing helps. You don't have to think of it and you also don't have to make the time to go do it. So if you have the ability to do something like that, set up ordering, automatic subscriptions, things like that, that always takes some things off your plate. Um, the other thing, and I, I don't know, there's, it's kind of tough to, to say this without it sounding really depressing. So I don't mean it this way. But I think it's important when you have uh, a new one at home, especially you know a second one even, to lower your expectations a little bit. And I don't mean settle. That's not how I mean it. What I mean is if you expect yourself to be able to perform at the same level to keep your house equally as clean, to be equally as fit, and to be equally as financially stable when you are single and unencumbered as when you are tired and exhausted and you have more people in your home and more mouths to feed and you're stressed, like those situations aren't the same. And so if you're looking at your body or how clean your home is or whatever else and thinking this isn't as good as it used to be like that's right cuz you're in a different situation than you used to be in right and so i think sometimes we forget to adjust those expectations like just a, a really tactical example um i am i have always been a very clean organized person like i'm a i'm an organizer my books are you can see them in the corner here on the video I like was they're organized see that melanie it's it looks very organized there in the back. <laughs> Yeah, like I'm I'm a very organized, like type A kind of person. Um, and so when my toddler first got to the point where now she's walking around and knocking things over and dumping toys on the floor, I was I was chasing around after her, trying to pick everything up. Like these toys go back in here. Let me put the books back on the bookshelf. And then I realized like she's just gonna make a mess again. So if I batch my cleanup, if I just wait until she falls asleep, I can just clean everything up then. And that means I have to accept that there's going to be some clutter on the floor from lunchtime to dinner time. That's just how it is. And that's okay. I wouldn't have lived like that before. I wouldn't have let that be the case when I had more bandwidth, but I don't. And so it's okay for me to re- reset that expectation. And I think uh, a, lot of, a lot of entrepreneurship is the same thing. You're living in a different way. Your priorities are different. Uh, the way you spend your time is different. And so you need to adjust all those other outcomes that also depend on your resources, your bandwidth, your time. Uh, Because you, it's not that you can't do it all. It's just that you have to decide your life is like a pie chart and you have to decide how much of your life you want to spend on these different activities. And so when one expands, when, you know, you spend more family time or more business time, that means something else has to, has to get smaller. And so you just have to be intentional about uh, when you're allocating more time and resources towards something, what are you going to take those resources away from? I like the pie chart analogy. I think, <laughs> I think we could draw a parallel from the, from the pie chart to content creation, no? To, for yeah. a company and for a young professional, for an entrepreneur. Would Absolutely. Be so, because there are so many platforms out there. So you have blogs, so written form, and then you have mm-hmm. podcast, audio, which we're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, There's video, live video, every kind of social media, photos. Gifts. I mean, there's so so many options, but you're just a human. There's only so much, uh, so many hours in the day. So if you're going to decide, I spend 30 minutes a day, or maybe that's you know you you choose a weekly number instead because you're going to batch your content for efficiency. So maybe you do four hours on the weekend, right? Um, or or on a Friday or whatever. Um, you know, decide how much time you're willing to allocate to it, and then 
decide where that time is going to come from. You know, that might mean that you have to spend less time doing something else. So just be intentional about that and figure out where, where you're going to trade those hours from one, uh, one activity to another. Yes. And I think that that X, that number of hours, it's individual. It could be like two hours for you, could be five for me and 30 minutes for somebody else. Yeah. Well, and there's a couple of factors that influence that. I mean, the first would be your own personal skill sets and passions. So for example, for me, I'm a writer first. I study journalism. I know that I can, I mean, I can put out thousands of words a day if I really need to, right? I could write until, until the cows come home. Um, but if you ask me to produce a podcast or edit a video, that's going to take me a much longer time because my skills, my experience, and my interests, frankly, are not as well aligned. So thinking about your own skills and interests, where those are, that's one way to do it, right? If I want to spend the least amount of time, how can I make best use of the skills that I have? If you're good at audio, you're good at video, you're good at writing or photography, like lean into that. Um, and the other thing uh, that you want to think about too is like, where, what is your audience most interested in? Because if you love podcasts, but your audience doesn't love podcasts, like that's going to be a problem, right? You're going to put all that effort into something your audience won't consume. So that's why you know, talking to the audience and understanding what do they like, who do they trust, where do they find content, that can be so, so helpful for figuring out, you know, the time that I'm spending, is it going to be on something that they like? Uh, that's, that's always easier to know up front than to have to figure it out and, and start again later. It's true. I think a lot of people are afraid to ask their audience too. They don't feel comfortable to ask, to ask their colleagues instead. You know, I think if you're working in a marketing team or you're the only marketing person, yeah. In the team, you might be just asking the CEO, like, all right, so uh, is this fine? Or what, what do we put out next month, for example, or for the next quarter? Yeah. So uh, coming at you with another analogy, you know, you knew it was coming. Um, I like to think of the, the content you create as, as gift giving. Um, so a lot of times when we're only asking internally, it's giving other people the gifts that you like, and you, there's someone in your life who does this, you know, it, they didn't think about what your hobbies are or your interests. They gave you the gift that they wanted to give you, right? It wasn't necessarily what you wanted, what you valued. So when we are only, you know, getting stuck in our head, deciding what our audience probably wants, we're, we might be doing the same thing, giving them things that they're like, oh, great, I'll put this in the closet and just leave this over here. I'm never going to wear that. I'm never going to use that, right? We don't want to give them that experience. And the best way to know is, hey, you're, you know, your birthday's coming up. What do, you, what do you need this year? Are you still into golf? Are you still, you know, I don't know, loving this particular show or this team? Uh, by, by checking in, by talking to, to your audience, the recipient of your gifts, uh, you're going to get more information about what they like, what they value, what they will use, uh, what their challenges and needs are. And that can all inform and make sure that the time you are spending on content is actually, you know, the way you're communicating is is the way that they like to communicate, that you're giving them gifts that they actually appreciate. Love that analogy. Keep them coming, <laughs> Melanie. <laughs> so... Okay. You, you're very creative, Melanie. So I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience that are not creative. Um, how do you, okay. Besides your daily life and your daily routines, like how do you go about like consolidating all the ideas and coming up with these ideas? So, right. Yeah. So first things first, everyone in the audience is creative promise everyone. Um, I think I feel really strongly about this because I think when we're young, when we're kids, we are all creative. You all tell crazy stories about a dinosaur and an alien and, you know, you take a cardboard box and you turn it into a spaceship and you color. I mean, we are all super creative as kids. And what happens is, and, and the data backs this up, studies have shown this, that the older we get, the more we learn to suppress those ideas because someone says that's not real or that wouldn't really happen or grow up, right? You know, no more imaginary friend. Like they, they shut it down as part of growing up. And so it's in there. Like it's in there. We've just been conditioned to not tap into it. We've been conditioned to ignore those instincts. And so they're quiet. And so what you really need is just a method for waking it up because it's in there. It always has been. It's just a matter of figuring out how can I pull that voice out and how can I start listening to it more? And so the best way to do that is with some kind of system. Um, so like I mentioned before, my, my book is, is focused on that and giving you a system for 
tapping into uh, into your ideas. The the goal being that if, if you have a checklist you can run through, it kind of prompts your brain and says, oh yeah, that is an option. You know, it kind of gives you a, a checklist to run through. So that is one idea. Um, but there are other systems out there too. It may be that, you know, you decide you're going to write every morning for half an hour, no matter how good it is, just because you want to get practicing, you want to get faster, you want to get better. Um, but I think, again, having a system it's not going to happen on its own, right? Your, your creativity is not going to come out on its own. Um, you need to give it, give it some, some confines. You need to give it a schedule. You need to give it some, some guardrails and say, okay, this is, this is creative time. This is, this is time to, to speak up and, and let that voice be free. Um, you need to give it that permission. Yes. Okay. And turn off your phone and all the notifications <laughs> so you don't switch. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the tactical stuff too. Yeah. Make sure you're, um, you know, you're in an environment that you work best. I think it's it's really tempting to say like you need to go in your office and you need to close the door and you need to like, you know, I don't know, put a, light a candle. But like everyone's ideal working conditions are different. For some people, going for a walk in nature like will make all of their ideas just come to them. Maybe for some people, it's working out. I need to go on a run or lift some weights and I'm suddenly going to feel like I've got creative energy. Um, for me, I really like to work in cafes I love the energy of being in a, you know, a whole group of people who are working on their own things, connecting with people, just the energy of that kind of place, the, the sounds and the feeling of it um, really, really lights me up. And so I know that if I, I want to get some creative work done, it's not going to happen uh, at my desk. It's not going to happen, um, you know, sort of bottled up and forced it for me, if I want to get myself in my creative mindset. Um, I know that voice talks loudest when I'm I'm in a in a group of other creatives who are who are doing what they love. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's important to find your your where you can find your zone. You know. Um, yeah. I think that's important, and it's individual as well. So, it, what question? I mean, there might be some questions that you might have already, some set questions that you might have that you ask yourself when developing content as an entrepreneur. Are there a set of questions? Yeah, for sure. So for every piece of content that I'm trying to come up with, there's actually two key questions that I always ask. So the first one is, uh, what will this content be about? What's the focus? Um, you know, what is the way we're going to approach this story? Are we going to talk about people or history or data or something else? Um, you know, how are we going to tell this story? So that's, that's the first one, the focus. Uh, and then the second one is the format. So once we know our focus and we say, okay, I'm going to tell a story about, you know, how I came up with the idea for this product or, you know, the history of this particular product type, for example. Then the question you ask is, what's the best way to bring that to life? What's the best way to bring that to life? So that's where the conversation would come in about, should this be a video or a blog post or a podcast or something else? So those are two questions that I make sure are always part of a content conversation. What's the focus? And then which format is best to bring it to life? That's, that's two very good questions. And then batch that every Monday, exactly. every Sunday, whenever you want to work on that. Okay. That's right. That's great. That's a really cool, uh, like, Really good tactical advice and very good questions. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that. That's um, that's really what the the premise of the book is about too. So in the book, I'll, I walk through a bunch of different focuses and a bunch of different formats to kind of coach you through. You know, if you're you're feeling stuck, here are what some of those options might be, and here are some examples of how that comes to life. Um, and there's also a section in each you know in each chapter, like here are questions to consider. So if you're thinking about making a video. Here's what you want to think about. Um, are you going to be on camera? Is the lighting sufficient? You know, it's giving you all those different prompts uh, to kind of walk you through, uh, get you one step closer to, to making that content come to life. So you are an amazing storyteller, Melanie, but <laughs> you're also a great entrepreneur with so much finesse and creativity, <laughs> you know, from my perspective. Uh, and before this conversation, I heard that you pitched yourself as a guest to over 80 podcasts. Oh and, yeah. And and Facebook live shows. How did you go about <laughs> doing that? Yeah. So um I'm very lucky in that when I uh my last sort of full-time job where I was doing what I really love, I was at the New York Times. And um as part of my role there, I was already, you know, appearing on a couple podcasts to talk about the work that our team did. Um, I spoke at a conference and shared some research that our team had done. 
so I was already sort of playing in that space just a little bit. Um, but I knew that I liked it and I wanted to do more of it. So I did what I think most entrepreneurs do. I dove it all in and I studied and I read and I tried to figure out uh, how can I learn to be a better speaker? How can I learn to be a, a good podcast guest? And so uh, it was just, it's a numbers game. So when I first started uh, you know, joining podcasts and things like that, I, I would just reach out and ask, hey, I listened to your show and you have to be truthful, right? I listened to your show. I think I could add some value to your audience. Here's what I, I think we could talk about. If you think it's a fit, let me know. If not, no problem. Um, so I did a lot of that kind of outreach just to get started. It's like cold calling, right? Um, and then the good news is that once you get started, like many things in life, it comes with momentum. So once I had been on five shows, some people were hearing me on those shows and inviting me on other shows. And then once I had done 10 or 15 shows, people were hearing me on those shows and inviting me on theirs, right? So it kind of snowballed. It built a lot of momentum for itself. And so, uh, yeah, uh, this was early 2020 was my, uh, my major, major push. Uh, my book had come out and it was just the beginning of lockdown. And so I had to cancel my book tour. I had to cancel all the book signings. I was really bummed out, but I thought, okay, what can I do? And what I can do is meet people remotely. So that's when I just went all in and I was like calling up all the friends, calling in all the favors. And I was like, hey, let's do a virtual book tour. Can I come on your podcast? Can I come on your you know, Facebook live show, join you on your Instagram live? Like, what can I do uh, to, to meet and, and talk to as many people as possible during the same time so that I can, I can spread the word and add as much value in a short, in a short window? Yeah, like... Um... <laughs> You mentioned about the book tour. I, I read also online that you used a birthday to get thousands of people to buy your book. <laughs> what was I your did. thought process around that? Melody? Because I found <laughs> I that like, extremely creative and full with finesse. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a little unconventional, but basically, uh, you know, around six months after my book had come out, uh, my birthday was coming up and I thought, well, birthdays is a time where people think of gifts and, you know, you like to be nice to the person whose birthday it is. So I thought, here's what I'll do. I'll bring the price of my ebook down to 99 cents because a dollar is easy. Anybody could hopefully have a dollar if they're looking for a resource like this. Um, I'll bring it down to a dollar and I'll say, hey, it's my birthday. Uh, to help me celebrate, would you help me get this book to the top of the charts, right? And you can do that by just buying a copy of the ebook for 99 cents. And so it was sort of this collective excitement where people felt like they were a part of something we were watching the numbers and people were reporting back, oh, it's number 83. Oh, it's number 62. You know, watching it climb the charts as people were buying their 99 cent copies. Um, so it was just a really fun way to, to have an excuse to, you know, to talk about it again and, and build some conversation and momentum around it. And uh, I figured, you know, it's my birthday. So here's my gift. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop it down to 99 cents and hopefully we can all celebrate the rise of the charts. So I don't, I don't know where that idea came from necessarily. I can't remember exactly, you know, how it came to be, but I was always looking for interesting ways to try to, you know, have it be part of the conversation in a way that makes sense, that doesn't feel forced because nobody likes to be, oh, buy my book, buy my book every single day. Like they'll get sick of it. I'll get sick of it. So I had to find, you know, what's a, what's a, a reason to talk about it that makes sense. Um, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs face that too. I hear a lot from young entrepreneurs like, you know, my family has stopped buying or, you know, my friends won't support my business. And, and like, sometimes that's because we're, we're, we're that broken record. Every time we see them or every time we message them, it's, Hey, I have new product. Hey, I have new product. Hey, have you bought this product? They're going to get sick of that too. You know, we got to find new audience uh, and new reasons to have, have a slightly different conversation. So that's what I was looking for. And I figured my birthday was as good a time as any. Oh, I love it. I love it so much, <laughs> Melanie. Uh, it's amazing. It's an amazing idea. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, it was, it was an experiment. I think, you know, that's, that's what I, I really tried to encourage to everything we do doesn't have to work as long as we're learning from it and we're measuring. Um, so I did a lot of experiments like that where some of them didn't work, you know, some things just fell flat and other things worked really well. So it was just, uh, I was trying to have fun with it and see, okay, well, what can I try now? What's, what's something, you know, out there that I could just experiment with and see if it works. It's true. It is true. <laughs> we should have more fun in life, you know, Yeah. And laugh. Yeah. <laughs> we spoke about content creation a lot about like for entrepreneurs, but how would that be for young professionals? Let's say that I'm, um, 
I'm comfortable. I'm a project manager. I'm working at Google. Sure. Like I'm a 25 year old. Uh, why should I bother about content creation, Melanie? Well, first of all, congrats because Google is an awesome company to work with. So young, so good, good for you. Um, but I think you know there's there's benefit to sharing your story and your expertise. Um, so you know if in, in this example you're a project manager, people probably come to you for advice on project management, on you know timelines, on on productivity, on. Uh, wrangling a team. There's probably a lot of skills, soft skills and hard skills that you know lots about and could teach people, could add a lot of value. The bonus of that is as you're sharing, you know, interesting tips and tools you use and recommendations for common problems, um, you know, you're not only helping other people by teaching them something, you're also demonstrating that you're pretty smart and you're pretty good at what you do, you know, and there's tons of value in having lots of people know that you're smart and you're good at what you do. Uh, that can that can come to bear fruit in so many ways. That could be podcast invites or invitations to speak at a conference or, hey, that's really smart. Would you like to write a piece about that for our magazine or our website? Um, that could be, hey, our client is looking for a project manager, actually. You know, uh, you know you, or do you do any consulting on the side? Or, uh, hey, we have the annual project management awards. Would you like to be a judge? I mean, there's so many different ways uh, that, you know, by putting yourself out there and having people know that you're really good at what you do and you know a lot about it, that can that can provide so, so many benefits for you, even if you're a professional. And that could also provide internal benefits. You know, you you get promoted or you're given new projects or or all kinds of things. You're given more resources to keep creating the stuff that's working, right? So you would say that... Um... Okay, I'm comfortable in my project management role uh, at Google. Like you would, you would encourage me to to go out there, just like build my own content on on LinkedIn or what's it, what or or Instagram, which whichever platform I I choose, and really yeah. like put out content on what I'm good at, and then whatever comes up, whatever opportunities come at me, I should say yes to those and say yes well, to life. And that will lead to more <laughs> doors opening up. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Like with the realistic understanding that, you know, not all of us are able to to use our time outside of work to do those kinds of things. If you have other responsibilities, like I'm not going to shame you for saying you don't have time to blog. That's, that's life. Right. Um, but what I am saying is if that type of thing is of interest to you. If you're looking to grow your influence, if you're looking to grow your audience, if you're looking for opportunities that could lead to you being on stage or writing a book or being on screen, then growing your influence and showcasing your expertise is a really good way to increase your chances of those things. And so if those kinds of goals are important to you, then it would probably be a really good idea to start showing all of those skills uh, on whatever channels you're comfortable with and make sure that people know how smart you are. Uh, they know that you know your stuff. They know that they can count on you to answer questions and solve problems. They know that you are someone who likes to teach and share with others. And so they can invite you into situations where you can continue to teach and share with others. I think that's a great advice, Melanie. I think a lot of people, like I said, we've spoken a lot about entrepreneurs like yourself and, and me, but there's a lot of people out there that are very comfortable in their, their jobs, you know, and they're not thinking about content creation, you know, yeah. say, well, and, or their stories. And I think it's also, you know, we all have seasons in life. I, I really believe that, you know, there are certain times where this is going to be a great idea for you. If you are uh, young, new in your career, you're unencumbered, you have the freedom uh, and the time to be able to do these kinds of things. And you, you want upward mobility. You're trying to rise in the ranks and get promoted and get awards, right? Then this is a really good thing for you to do. If you're later in your career, you are really happy where you are. You're not trying to move up from where you are. You're comfortable and you like this role and this is where you want to be. And maybe your family or home life doesn't allow you to, you know, to, to build bigger than where you are at the moment then this is probably not a great use of your time. Like I, I won't lie to anyone and say you have to be doing this stuff. You know, the reality is sometimes caring for your newborn or taking care of an aging parent or caring for your own physical and mental health or I don't know, putting all in on a project you currently have in front of you, that may be a better use of your time in a lot of cases. Um, but there may be a time when when this is a is a good use of your time and helps get you closer toward whatever goals are important at that time. 
Melanie, I had um, I have a question that is not related to content creation. <laughs> so, sure. Both of us were very young, right? But let's say that we go. Imagine your ninety-five-year-old self <laughs> coming back in time, meeting yeah. your twenty-five-year-old Melanie. What would she tell you? Oof. I, you know, I think there's. I mean, a couple of things. I think that. I wish I knew younger how to stand in my worth, um, which I know feels very like woo woo new agey. But what I mean is um, I used to find out, for example, that someone doing a similar job was getting paid more than me and it would make me feel bad, right? Like, oh, I must be bad. I must not be as good, right? And I wish that I had the confidence then like I do now and, and hopefully it will as, a, as, a, you know, as a, an elder uh, to say, hey, this is what I'm worth, and this is what this situation should be. Um, you know, not being entitled and demanding things that aren't expected, um, but you know, knowing when I am not being compensated for what I'm providing, or when I'm not being, you know, given the the acknowledgement or the the compensation that that is is relevant um, for the work I'm doing. And I think, had I known that earlier. Uh, I could probably be making a lot more now because this is the kind of thing that compounds. You know, if you don't stand up in your first job, then when you go get your next job, you're only going to get a little bit of an increase. And if you don't stand up in that job, you're only going to get a little bit of an increase next time. If you start early and negotiate higher, then you get to make much bigger jumps as you go. And so I wish I had learned to, to fight that fight and stand up for myself in that regard sooner. So definitely tell myself that. What else would I do? I don't know. I'd probably tell myself to just like be healthier. I'm sure. Like we all look, I look back on, you know, decisions we've all made when we were much younger. Um, and I'm like, man, I should have, you know, drank more water and like ate healthier, you know, and, and probably worked out more just so that I was setting my body up for long-term success. Okay. Yeah. I think the, 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 the first advice, I think it, that's a good one, Melanie. You know what? And also I've been interviewing a lot. I'm speaking to a lot of women on the podcast and um, it made me, I was doing some homework on the side and because your, your, um, your advice and your realization, it, it's not the first time I've heard it. Mm -hmm. And I, I've read a lot of studies that actually there's a common thread. There's a lot of women that, mm -hmm. that feel uncomfortable to speak about their worth or asking for a raise, you know? Yeah. Versus well, men. I think, I think a, a big part of it, and I know this is not at all our topic, but a big part of it is is how our society, you know, the expectations that society places on on genders differently. You know, the expectation for men is if you're assertive and aggressive and motivated and you push back and you stand up for yourself, that's a good thing. Like you are ambitious, you are a leader, right? Like you're gonna get things done. Typically, if a woman is aggressive and assertive and stands up for themselves. Uh, you know, and is is really pushing, then they're not necessarily seen in the same positive light. That's someone who is, uh, you know, they're they're not likable, or you know, they're they're too career focused, right? It's like a negative thing for women to to often have some of those same characteristics. And so, yeah, it's it's a lot harder to stand up, and it's a lot harder to be heard, even if you are standing up and, and speaking about those things. Um, which is also why, I mean. If this makes people feel more comfortable, especially if you're a young woman, a young professional, um, always bring the data because it is, it is easy to feel insecure in what you're asking for. If you're saying, I think I deserve this, it is much harder to argue with, this is the market rate for this role. I looked at 10 other roles with the same title. The average is X dollars more than mine. I believe that I therefore deserve an adjusted salary of X dollars more. It's not your opinion. You're bringing the data, right? And um, it's sometimes, if you're not feeling as confident, having the data to back you up can sometimes make that conversation a little easier. Yeah, that's a good advice. Um, what's the biggest misconception about content creation, you would say, Melanie? Mm, I think people think it's super easy. Um, and I don't mean to discourage anyone because there are certainly, as we talked about, ways to make it take less time and less resources. Um, but I think that it's one of those, everyone thinks that they can, they can do it and they don't necessarily know the work and the thought and the effort that goes into it. You know, it, we see this all the time. You know, you see an artist, uh, you know, sell a painting for half a million dollars and everyone goes, I could do that. But you didn't, 
you didn't do that. They did, right? And so I think there's that kind of perception about content sometimes. You see an influencer with a million followers or a YouTuber with 2 million subscribers and you think, I could do that. They're just putting out videos. They're just posting nice photos of outfits. I could do that. But you haven't, right? Because it's harder than, than it may seem. Um, and so I think it's just, you know, stand, stand in that worth, you know, you're, you're working hard, you're creating content, you're putting intention behind it. Um, and there are going to be people who don't appreciate it and that's okay. Yeah, it is true. You're completely naked out there, you know, when you're putting it's out true. content. Yeah. There's it's no a, it's a vulnerable thing. Yeah. You're an avid reader, Melanie, yes. and you're an author. So <laughs> can you name one to three books that have massively impacted your life? Mm. Yes. I can. <laughs> uh, let's see. So the book, Everybody Writes by Anne Handley. It might even be in view. Actually, it's not in view because I took it out to give it to someone. Um, but Anne Handley's book, Everybody Writes, I think everyone should read it because you know we all write text messages and emails and notes to a friend, letters, postcards, like you write. So this book is really great for helping you do that more intentionally, more strategically. Um, I recommend it to everyone. I tweeted the other day, I have ordered this book as a gift for people so many times that Amazon is like, you've ordered this 13 times before. Did you mean to order it again? And I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> so that's, that's a, top, a top one for sure. Uh, Phil M. Jones has a book called Exactly What to Say, um, which is all about the, the kind of the power of language and how making intentional choices with the language that you use can really change the outcomes. So just a tactical example from that book, the difference between, hey, uh, would you help me with something? Or would you be open to helping me with something? It's really the same question, but in one, you're asking for a favor and one, you're asking them to be open-minded and everyone loves to be seen as open-minded, right? Of, of course I would consider it. I wouldn't be a monster and not even consider your question, right? So little language swaps like that, that can be very impactful. So that's Phil M. Jones, exactly what to say. And the third one, do I have that one up here? Yes, I do. Um, this is Invisible Women, uh, Invisible Women. So very aligned with the last topic we were just talking about here, uh, data bias in a world designed for men. So what's really interesting about this book is it just points out some of those gaps, some of those things that happen, whether it's, you know, unequal wages or, um, you know, all those instances where data didn't take gender into consideration. And as a result, there was a negative outcome. So my favorite example from this book, um, every car, they always advertise their safety rating, right? You know, it's five-star, crash-tested, whatever it is. Well, uh, they're only required to use uh, dummies of male body proportions when they do crash testing. That's it. They're only required. So it's the driver's seat, average height of six feet, average weight of two, whatever it is, 225. Um, they don't, they are not required to test with a female body, you know, a female um, dummy. So that's different proportions. Our body parts fall at different points. The way a seatbelt lands on us is very different. Um, and then even those that do voluntarily add the, the female dummies, they put them in the passenger seat, which again, very different experience driving versus being in the passenger seat, right? So what that means is unintentionally, every car safety rating you've ever seen only applies to men, right? Without even realizing it, it only applies to men. And the result of that, of that oversight for, on data is that women tend to die in the same types of car accidents or be more seriously injured because the safety wasn't tested for their height, for their weight, for their bodies, right? Same thing with medical dose. Did it ever, ever think it's weird that like, you know, a, a 40 year old man who weighs, you know, 225 and a 16 year old girl who weighs 98 pounds take the same dose of medication as an adult? Kind of weird, right? So, you know, that book just really opened my eyes to making sure that I'm considering all the possibilities and that the decisions we make as business owners, especially, you know, they could have unintended consequences and we need to be mindful of all the effects of those things. So that book definitely opened my eyes uh, in so many ways. Wow. Uh, you know what? I loved how you were like, just not giving me the title. So you're like, all right, <laughs> this is the biggest takeaway. One, two, three. This is the next book, one, two, three. <laughs> so. Amazing example, yeah, and how great you are and like really telling a good story, you know, from your everyday life here. So. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Melanie, I had so much fun. I learned so much from you and I'm sure our audience uh, learned a lot from you as well. Where, um, 
where can people find you to learn more about you and uh, where can they go to say hello to you on social media and yeah. is there anything you like them to check out uh, for sure specifically? Yeah. So if you want to learn more about generating story ideas, of course, you're welcome to check out the book, which is the Content Fuel Framework, How to Generate Unlimited Story Ideas. If you go to contentfuelframework.com, that'll take you to my website. You can see all your options for buying it, but you'll also find my social links there. You'll find some downloadable resources that can help you with your content uh, and with you know conversions on your on your business, on social media and things like that. Um, you know, and you'll, you'll also just see more about me and some of the way, some of the things that I'm up to, you know, other podcasts that I'm joining and articles that I'm writing. So head to the website, it's contentfuelframework.com. Um, and if you look for me on social media, Melanie Diesel, D-E-Z-I-E-L, you will find me. There is usually only one of me. You'll probably know that it's me. Uh, and I spend most of my time on Twitter. So if you're a Twitter person too, then you can definitely find me and connect with me there. Thank you very much, Melanie. Thank you for listening to Fika with Rice. I hope you enjoyed the show. Who do you want to have on our show? Let us know by sending me an email at frederick at absoluteinternship.com. And before you go, if you like this conversation, don't forget to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or Spotify to get to listen to more inspirational stories and life hacks. We'll really appreciate it. See you next time and much gratitude for listening.